Today, uh, the talk that Google series is featuring author Marcy Madden and her wife Jeanette, Scotty Jeanette Madden. And uh, Mar Marcy recently wrote a book called Just Because My Husband is a Woman. And it's receiving five star ratings on Amazon. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to her telling us her story, um, her side of the story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, a little bit about Marcy and Scotty before they come up on stage. For those of you that are here uh, in the room, we've got free books. Um, so if you're nearby and you want to come, uh, please make your way over. We've got at least 50 copies and. Um, Ping me afterwards if uh, if you want extra. If you want some, we'll uh, we'll send we'll send you the extra. Marcy and Scotty are co-founders of Zuzu Bean Press, an independent publishing company dedicated to creating a safer, more loving world for LGBTQIA plus people and their families. They've been married for over 28 years. I've known them for about 20 20 plus of those years. <laughs> And each has a rich and varied background as business owners and also in the production and TV world. First, Marcy. Marcy went from managing several psychiatric offices in Marin and also has owned several production companies. She's been a director, producer, voiceover talent, and wildlife rehabilitator. And now she's an author. Her new book was released on October 11th, and it's entitled just because my husband is a woman. Marcy's side of the story. Scotty, who was just at Google last year giving her talk, has, sev has served in several capacities as well in the TV and film industry. He's been a director, she has been a director, a screenwriter, and adventure documentary reality showrunner. More recently, Scotty has added speaker and author to her bio. Her memoir, Getting Back to Me, From Girl to Boy to Woman in Just 50 Years, is on Amazon's LGBTQ biography bestseller list and is in the process of being made into a TV series. Marcy and Scotty share intimate and pertinent stories about their real life experience transitioning together. Their story is both vulnerable and prescient in our current times. Like I said, I've known Marcy and Scotty for over 20 years, and it's a great privilege and pleasure to bring them to the Talks at Google series. And so I'd like to welcome, first up, Scotty Jeanette Madden. Thank you, Monica. I'm out here to kind of set a little bit of context on the husband that Marcy spoke about. What's important for you to know is that um, for about three years solid, every morning, I would wake up at about 4 a.m. and I would pray to God for Marcy. And Marcy came. I wasn't praying for her by name, <laughs> but I knew in the deepest fiber of my being that Marcy was out there, and I just wanted God to finally bring her to me. I knew it as truly as I knew it that I was a woman. I knew that despite what my body was telling me, what everybody else in my life was telling me, that I was a woman. I also knew that Marcy was out there. So when Marcy says, just because, the story goes a little bit deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of her that she wrote this book, but even more what I'm happy about is for you all to know now what I've always known, and that's how amazing Marcy is. So I'll let her tell you the rest. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Thank you, Monica, so much. It really is a pleasure to be here. Being here with Scotty's book last year, I had no idea that I <laughs> would write a book. Um, and I guess I should tell you that it's obvious because of what Scotty just said and the title of my book that there's not going to be a big aha ending at the end of the talk. You have that 
up front. So um, the point of what I want to be here for today is um, to tell you the part that comes after the ellipses, just because my husband's a woman, dot, 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 Marcy's side of the story. Uh, and uh, just a little bit of a warning here. I don't know if any of you have ever thought that you might want to write a book. I think it's kind of a romantic idea that a lot of us share. I certainly did. But my problem was I thought I would never have a subject matter. So just, you know, this is a warning to be careful what you wish for. So yes, my spouse, Scotty, is transgender. Um, we've been married almost 29 years. 20 of those years, I thought I was married to my husband, Scott. Then one morning, Scotty came with coffee early and blurted out the words that she was a woman. This was 20 years into our marriage, and it wasn't planned. It was just as if her emotions and her mouth took over. It was not something that she ever really expected to reveal. And um, she really thought that she'd be going to her grave with this secret. Nowadays, we hear transgender, that word, quite a bit. It's been in the media a lot. We're very familiar with it. Um, it was not that familiar a word to me, especially in my early years. But more people have stepped out of the darkness of their feelings and their sadness and are, are coming forward and speaking up. Um, of course, we still really have a long way to go to find acceptance because we can sense that, I think, in the political um, arena. Although, after the elections from last night and the results, I think we've got some positive movement forward again in that arena, too. So Scotty wrote her book about coming out. And we don't really hear much about what goes on when a person's married and what happens to the spouse when one person wants to transition. And statistically, the most recent statistics that we have say that only 21% of marriages where someone transitions survive. So when Scotty came out, and we'd already been married for 20 years, um, what happened was when she would be going on her book signings and tours, uh, and there'd come time for Q&A, perhaps, in one of those sessions, uh, some people would raise their hands and start addressing questions to me, like, how did you do this? And, and why did you do it? What, what was it that prompted you to want to stay? Um, because a lot of times what they would do would be to put themselves in my position, and they just couldn't imagine it. Um, so just because my husband's a woman is, is my story. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of my history, uh, because it, it goes way back into the dark ages. <clears throat> uh, but I think part of my upbringing was, was a big arc in my whole journey of coming around to accepting uh, what was happening in our lives. Um, I was born and raised in New England, um, very much the uh, boarding school type of raising. Um, manners were a big thing in our household. Both my parents had been to boarding school. Um, I had, uh, still have, three brothers. And even from the early days, when people would ask my mother how many kids she had, her answer was, I have four boys and one's a girl. So as I look back on my life getting ready to write this book, I started to see little hints along the way of things that I was learning that either stood in my way for growth or actually helped me along the way. But so it was expected. I, too, went to boarding school. I was there for three years. Um, and I think I'll tell you a little sidebar story just to show you, again, how far I've had to come with this whole topic. Um, but I remember once sitting my roommate down after I'd been there for several months. And I said, have I done something wrong? Have I said something wrong to the other girls in the house? They just seem like they're very standoffish. And I feel like 
maybe I said something I wasn't aware of that pissed them off. And she said, oh, well, and she shut the door to our bedroom and she sat on the bed opposite me and she said, well, they think you're a lesbian. And I went, oh my God, what's a lesbian? <laughs> So to say I was somewhat innocent is perhaps an understatement. Um, after boarding school, I went to a two-year college, a woman's college in upstate New York, and uh, majored in an overseas program, which took me to Geneva, Switzerland for a year, where I, where I worked. And um, after that, I came home in 1969. And I ended up moving to California starting out here in the Bay Area. And um, for several years, I was working for um, psychiatrists during those years. Um, there's a few stories about experiences with them and of that in, um, in my book. Some of it was quite humorous. And also, another little breadcrumb that I'd forgotten about until, again, I went back in my memory to think about what to write about in my book, and I went, Oh wait, I was kind of exposed to the subject of transgender back then, but I hadn't even remembered it or put it together until looking back. So after several years with the shrinks, um, I started in the production business. I volunteered for a company and then I ended up being one of the owners of it. It was a recording studio in San Francisco. Um, I had gotten married while I was still working for the psychiatrists. Then when I went to work at the recording studio, I fell in love with uh, one of the partners in that. And um, so ended up in a divorce, moving into marriage number two. And as I look back, what I realized was I really have always been looking for love. I always had been. and. I felt like my parents had a storybook marriage. My dad would come home from work every night and find my mother first and give her a movie dip kiss when he got home. And they'd sit and have a cocktail together and he would download his day. And he really, she was his muse and his confidant and his advisor. And I just thought that's what a marriage should be like. And so when mine weren't fitting that or when it felt like the feelings were gone, mostly probably just because we settled into an everyday life, I thought the love was gone. And so that's how I would end up being attracted to somebody else and leave that marriage and go into another one. Um, believe it or not, I actually repeated the process again. So I met this wonderful, um, very creative, witty, funny um, writer who was with one of the ad agencies who was our client. And we started having lunches together. And uh, of course, I thought, well, this is the one. He's the one. You know, Number two was not working out so well. Uh, the chinks in the armor were definitely showing. So um, sure enough, I broke off that marriage and entered number three. And years down the line of that marriage, I think I hung in there for a while, uh, he was the one who broke it off. So at least that was a little bit of a change in my pattern. Um, and he also had not been faithful. So uh, I realized I, I probably just needed to really reevaluate what I was looking for and how I was looking for it and needed some space to figure out who I really was. So I lived on my own for a while. And then along came Scott. I had no idea, because people ask me this all the time, no, I had no idea that Scott was anything but a creative, wonderful, thoughtful, loving, smart, witty, funny man who was um, very much in love with me. And so this one, especially because I had taken the time, I hadn't leapt from one relationship to another, um, this just felt right. And we fell together pretty much from day one except I get teased that I sent Scott home the first night because, you know, I didn't want to seem like I was too easy. <laughs> um, so at this point, I want to read you a little bit from my book because I've hinted that 
Um, surprisingly to myself, there were some breadcrumbs along the way that were maybe little clues of, of what was really going on that I hadn't really seen for what they were. So um, this might tell you a little bit about what that was like for me. This is yours. No, I have, I have like, you know, placeholders and everything. I love your book. Getting back to me. Oh, thank you. Thanks thank for you. the plug. Yeah, I know. I did that on purpose. OK. <clears throat> Journey back with me to 1992. Some of you probably weren't even born then, so. Scott and I were on a TV shoot in India for two weeks. Being in India is like taking all the volume and color saturation knobs on your viewing and listening devices and turning them up to the max. The colors are intensely vibrant and can burn your eyeballs. The sounds are a strange symphony, symphony of familiar and unfamiliar noises. And the smells, ah, the smells. Smoke mixed with fragrant flowers, some not so fragrant elements, incense and teeming life. We visited temples and teachers and mountain shrines. And during the annual Magh Mela, we took a boat out onto the water at sunset at the sacred confluence of the three rivers, the Ganges, the Yamuna, and the Saraswati, where hundreds of people were wading and dipping in the water to be cleansed and to pray. I took the opportunity to pray, too. The energy was thick with the, vibrant, with the vibration of something otherworldly, something hallowed. Since Scott and I were into yoga, we felt deeply affected by being in the land where yoga was born. We were so grateful, even giddy, to be there. Though the host of the TV show was far from home, including mentally and emotionally, Scott and I felt very much at home. <clears throat> we were curious to see and try everything. Despite the challenges of a small crew with lots of equipment to lug around, <clears throat> and despite the show's host hosts mini tantrums, we thrived. The crew were all good friends of ours, family really. We were all like kids in a new playground. One day, we visited a Jain temple near our hotel in Mount Abu. The temple was built into a hillside and had no decoration or indication on the outside that it was a temple. This was to protect it from attack at wartime. It just looked like part of the rocky hillside, disguised so it could not be seen from the air. Once we stepped inside, we were in a wonderland of carved marble. It took the craftsmen years and years to complete the work. There was room after room of intricately carved marble, and every inch of space was done. Floors, ceilings, walls, and columns. Often there were carvings within carvings, one carved marble column within another. It was as if the whole temple was made of the most intricate, delicate white lace. In some places, you could look into an anteroom and see other shapes and figures that were so tucked away it seemed we weren't even supposed to see them. One such room had two huge, life-size mar marble elephants. I could just see them through the lacy wall and door that was only cracked open. And there were statues of deities and saints surrounding the outer circle of the temple. They all had brightly painted eyes that when you stared at them, drew you into a deep and meditative state. There was one such statue that completely had me mesmerized. I just had to keep staring into those all-knowing eyes. I was filled with a feeling of warm love. I felt completely connected, completely one with that being, and with everything around me. And Scott was there too, seemingly in the same state. When we compared our experiences, Scott told me that as his gaze was locked on the statue, he saw himself reach back to the middle of his shoulders, grasp a zipper, and unzip from there, and up over the top of his head, until the sheath that was his body just fell away, revealing a body made purely of light. 
as the sheath fell away like a lightweight Halloween costume. He stepped out of his skin to stand as the new light being who said to him, I'll miss Scott, he was really fun. I was confused by that and a bit frightened. It sounded as if Scott was not long for this world. Was he going to die? Scott didn't really seem very concerned about it, so I didn't say anything about the questions it brought up in me. He seemed deeply touched by the experience. It was amazing. Over the years since that trip to India, I would flash back on Scott's experience in the Jain temple, and I often wondered if he did too, if he relived the words, I'll miss Scott, he was really fun. Now I know each of us did revisit that experience many times, and now those words have a different significance to me. I had taken the experience then as a spiritual experience where Scott was becoming less attached to the physical world and identifying more with his universal self. Yes, he was less attached to the physical, but not necessarily for spiritual reasons. This was real, physical, a direct hotline to who he was. He was less attached to his body because he never felt he belonged in it. He probably felt like unzipping it and stepping out of it most of the time, and yet he might have to stay encased in that ill-fitting costume for the rest of his life. So you've had a little glimpse into my personal history. As I said, there's more in the book, some, um, <clears throat> some fun stories. This isn't all scary stuff. Um, though transgender has been around for centuries, it really, as I said, has not been talked about very much until more recently. And as people have talked about it and come out, some of the names you know, I'll let you fill in the blanks, um, and covered by the media. Um, one of, one of my earliest experiences of this was when I was watching an Oprah show. And Oprah had on a couple where one of the two had transgendered. And they, um, the couple was staying together. They were a beautiful couple, happily married. They had kids. Um, the, the one who had been a, a husband was a doctor and was maintaining now her practice. She was gorgeous, by the way. And they talked about their whole experience. And I swear to God, I looked at the television and said out loud, well, at least I'll never have to deal with that. <laughs> so I want to be sharing this with you because that's an example of how far I've had to come. That was my feeling about what transgender was at the time. So suffice to, to say, it's been quite an arc. My life has been an arc of discovery, of questioning, until I could find peace and understanding and love. I talk about all the phases that I went through. And I think they're the phases of loss anyway for a lot of people. You know, I, I went through denial, um, fears, ultimatums, okay, you can do this as long as you don't do that. Okay, you can pierce your ears and grow your hair, but no way are you going to wear dresses. And at the time, Scotty would say, that was, that's okay, that's enough. I don't really want more. Um, but obviously, for a lot of trans people, they're not really complete with their journey until they even go all the way through the point of having surgery and having the body that bespeaks the gender they identify with. Um, I was so determined that this was just maybe a phase or a midlife crisis. In fact, when Scotty came downstairs to say to me that early morning with the two cups of coffee and just blurted out, the first words she said were, I don't know who I am. And so my first thought was, oh God, midlife crisis, you're going to want a Porsche. And suffice to say that as the journey progressed, I was kind of wishing it had been the desire for a Porsche. Um, I had bouts where I played Nancy Drew. I'll get back to that in a minute. But I also sent Scotty to our 
homeopath to get a remedy. Because I thought, you know, there's just some kind of mix up in the system. All she needs is rebalancing of some kind. And to her credit, she went. I'm sure rolling her proverbial eyes in her head the whole way, but she was willing to do that for me. So all of my steps were baby steps towards acceptance. Now, I don't know if any of you grew up with Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew was a series of uh, detective books about a young woman who was a detective. Um, they've been upgraded even over the years because they were a very famous, popular series. And I think now Nancy probably does drive a Porsche. At the time, she drove a Roadster. So you're just going to have to Google that and figure out how that old car looked. But that I started snooping around. I couldn't stand the feeling that there was a secret. And even though Scotty had come out to me, I didn't understand what transgender was. I started researching, which actually was kind of a mistake, because as you of all people probably know, a lot of the things you can find on the internet are um, disturbing. You can find very disturbing stories. So I thought, well, this isn't where I want to be. So I admit I would go into Scotty's computer and look for clues. And so I became quite the detective. Um, and I was pretty good at it, actually. Uh, I surprised myself at, at how good I was at finding phone numbers that were coded and things like that. So um, I don't know if you can say that you know someone who's transgender. Uh, whether you have a family member or a friend. Um, but now that you've met Scotty, you can no longer say you don't know someone who's transgender. And I don't know if there's any questions that we can check in to see if anyone's asked questions. If not, um, the, the so no questions on the dory, but this is a good time to remind people who are listening on live stream, if you have questions, um, please be sure to write them in the dory, and we'll get back to them in a few. Great. Thank you, Monica. Um, part of the reason I say that is because um, Scotty and I are making a real point to getting out and about. We've spoken at universities and uh, other corporations and um, LGBTQ organizations, IA+, um, because we really want our lives to be an open book. We want us to be the people that you can count on to ask questions of, where no one will be upset by the question, no one will feel um, shamed or, or hurt by a question, because we really want people to be educated about this. Um, when I've run into any kind of resistance or bumps with people, <clears throat> I really find it's because people don't really understand. One of the biggest signs of that is somebody might say, um, why would you choose to be a woman? And a lot of my women friends will say that. Who would want to choose to be a woman? Um, but it's, it's not a matter of choice. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's really important to say. Um, people ask me why and how I did it. So a big part of what I had to do was look through my own concepts. What is a husband? What is a wife? What is marriage? What is love? What is gender? I mean, heck, I'd already been misgendered as a lesbian years before. So what's in a word? And I, I dug deeply into those words, but my relationship with them. What did I think love was? And what did I think a husband was? Um, you know, as my mate and my spouse and my beloved, Scotty was fulfilling those things that we really look for the most in a relationship. So I thought, well, does it matter? that I call this person my husband? Or do I have love? And I kept thinking how I had looked for love 
okay, in all the wrong places. I'd looked for love for a long time until I found Scotty. And I also thought about all the ways that, that she had stuck with me, that she had really been generous. She's a great cook, which really helps. Um, but took good care of me all along the way, was loving, was the love I'd always looked for. Um, when I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, she didn't run away, she took care of me and went with the doctor to me and has always supported me throughout the whole process. So looking at the words that we have and re-asking ourselves, how do I relate to that? Um, how do I relate to the things that my parents or peers or teachers taught me back when. Um, it's really a valuable thing to do. And we've often played a game with people when we've talked, it's, we call it the binary game, and asked people to say some of the things that um, maybe they were taught or was said to them when they were little or even now that has affected their opinion of something. And even with the young people in the universities, it's amazing how much those kinds of messages are still being given to them. You know, Scotty will often share how um, her dad would say to Scott, um, you run like a girl. Or if you're, <laughs> you're going to cry like that, Mary Jane, go put on a dress. So first of all, that's a double whammy of putting a woman down, but also telling your son that he's less than by saying he's like a girl. Um, my mother really screwed me up because she um, wanted me to not like drive like a girl or throw a ball like a girl. But so she was the one who had to teach me how to do that. So that's kind of confusing. Did you have something, Monica? Yeah, there's a question on the dory and it's, um relevant to, to how you're speaking about these questions that you're asking yourselves um, around binary and what, what that means. So the question is, um, how did you feel about the impact on your own identity, um, you know, given that you were you know, part of a binary uh, you know, woman? Um, w when did you decide to continue to be with your trans partner? Did you feel your identity was being erased? Oh, just a cute, light little question. Um, I, it did occur to me that I would maybe leave. I think it was a knee-jerk reaction, like, well, I can't be here. I'm not a lesbian. I can't be with this person. Um, but again, by evaluating some of those things, well, wait a minute. Who is this person? Um, I had to really think about that, and, and I'll get to the erasure part in a minute, because I do have an answer about that too. But um, one of the biggest words I, I really had to look at was commitment, because I'd already been in marriages where basically I gave up on the commitment, or someone gave up on me. So what is commitment? I mean, in our vows we say, till death do us part. Um, so. And I started looking at other couples who have stayed together, like Michael Fox and um, uh, Christopher Reeves. And you know, stuff happens in life, and stuff happens to your partner. So do you walk away? As I said, Scotty hadn't walked away from me when I got a deathly ill diagnosis. So um, looking at commitment was one thing. Um, yes, it made me question a lot about me and me as a woman at first. Um, and I used to sometimes te tease that, well, now I'm the one who wears the pants in the family. Scotty's very into feminine stuff and I wasn't, I was a tomboy. So uh, yes, it made me question my own identity as a woman. Um, another sidebar was because Scotty was getting so much attention uh, I started to ask the question, what am I, chopped liver? I felt, it was more like I just pushed, I felt pushed aside a bit as a person. A um, couple things that helped me get through that was Scotty herself. Because, and, and I want to say this because sometimes you'll hear uh, 
that, that trans people are selfish. And I think especially if they come later in age, they come out later in age, they, they just want their life. They've put it off for long enough. Damn it, I want to be who I am. Scotty was very generous and patient with me. And I could beat on her chest and scream and cry and accuse. How could you do this to me? How could you lie to me this long? Um, and, but learn, because she was patient, and we talked about everything. We worked it all out together. Um, that she wasn't lying to me, that actually she was the opposite of being selfish. She had um, pretended to be a man for all that time so that she wouldn't hurt me. So um, the other side of that is our friends. Thank God the, the friends that we have and the family that we have in our lives um, didn't allow me to be chopped liver for too long because Pretty much as soon as they would hear the news, the next question would be turning to me and go, how are you? So I was included. They knew that this might be hard for me. And they, I felt that they were there to support me. And I have a couple funny stories about friends, too. But it sounds like that was certainly one of the questions I asked you. How are you? <laughs> right. And I'm glad you're doing well. Um, that was uh, another question that has come up, actually two questions. Um, one is. How has your network of family and friends changed over time? Uh, and a, a question that I actually had, too, uh, just out of curiosity, what in your day-to-day -day has changed? Like, what's different in your day-to-day -day life and your relationship with Scotty? Wow. OK, you may need to remind me of some of those. So. Sure. Um, well, family and friends, so this is maybe a good place for me to tell a couple of my friends' stories. <laughs> because I realized, too, one of my biggest fears was telling people. Like, are they going to be shocked? Are they going to think we're weird? Obviously, they think we're queer, now that I know what queer means. But um, I, I really was afraid of people's reaction and that we might be shunned and rejected. And um, so I. To give these two examples in the book, too. A dear friend, Melissa, who I had worked with for a really long time, I waited. I didn't want to tell people for a really long time. I think because I kept hoping that Scotty would suddenly wake up someday and it would, oh my god, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm your husband again. But that never came. So um, I, I was feeling quite alone for a long time. And uh, I told my friend, Melissa, who was there to visit, I said, you know what, I have something to tell you. And she went, what? And I said, well, Scotty's a woman. And she said, oh, thank God. I thought you were going to say you were splitting up. And that instantly, it did something inside my whole being. Like, this wasn't a bad thing that, that Scotty was, was trans. The bad thing was this love story that so many of our friends had subscribed to and looked up to and wanted to clone my husband to have one of their own like him. That's what mattered to them was our love and preserving that. So, so the other one was um, I was sharing with a, a friend who is a lesbian uh, of our childhood crushes. And I had a mad crush on Richard Chamberlain who played Dr. Kildare in a TV series way back when I think TV was still black and white. But I just had the biggest crush on him. And she said, oh, really? My crush was Haley Mills. So um, I, I said, yeah, I know. But then I find out that, that Richard Chamberlain is, is gay. And she goes, yeah. And you ended up with Haley Mills. <laughs> nice. Oh, and day so to day. the biggest change day to day in your life and in your relationship with Scotty? I'm more into makeup now because I have someone who can teach me. I really saw how much I was a tomboy and I shunned makeup. And Scotty was so into it. At first, it really bugged me. But, um, but then I would watch her put it on and I'd go, oh, where'd you get that color? Or, so uh, makeup is a day to day change. Um, I think part of it is also my priorities have changed. Some of that has been with the diagnosis that I got, but um, 
I'm relying a lot on my humor. I, al I always did, but I think that was also one of the things that got me through. And seeing the uh, synchronicity in everything that happens around me and how sometimes things are almost a joke by the universe or a perfect pun on life itself. Um, I'm, I'm now less uh, resistant to being affectionate in public with Scotty. Uh, I was at first like, oh, don't kiss me. Oh, don't hold my hand. And now I'll be the one to reach for her hand or, or give her a kiss. So because you know what? I don't care. Um, my relationship even to the word lesbian, like I was worried that people would think I'm a lesbian because now I was with a woman. But of course, I flashed back on my high school days and went, hmm, OK, that, that's interesting. Um, but I don't need a label. People kind of want to put you in a box and name it something. And um, I don't have to be, be a lesbian to be in love with my spouse just because she's a woman. Nice. Um, are there any questions here in the audience? Yes. Mike Renners. Thank you. So Marcy, my question is, um, are, are there any, I mean, there are so many spiritual aspects to what you've just described, but are there any other lessons that were particularly powerful for you from a kind of spiritual point of view about what's happened? Um, yeah, thank you, great question. Um, I think contemplation was an important one, and contemplating words, and, and does this resonate with me? Do I need to accept this word anymore in my vocabulary? But one of the things that released me, I think, the most is that um, I believe in karma, uh, and, and not kind of the everyday variety, the way some people sling it around. I mean, I really do believe that um, what goes around comes around, um, and that everything in one's life is a result of past behaviors, thoughts, beliefs, actions. So once I kind of had this aha that Scotty didn't do this to me. I was in this situation because it was my karma to be in this situation. I might not exactly see the reason why, but I was supposed to be here. And that erased the blame. It wasn't Scotty's fault. Scotty wasn't doing this to me. I was supposed to be here. So now what are you going to do with it? And um, it was actually Scott's, Scotty's dad who had a saying that became my, my guiding light through all the rest of my process, which kind of has to do with that. And <clears throat> Jim Madden used to say, you can go sitting up in the saddle or strapped across it, but you're going riding, Jesse James. <laughs> nice. Good. So we have an, another question in the audience. Hi. Hi. Hi, Marcy. Um, I just want to ask, how did you guys first meet, and how long did you date before you got married? Ah. We first met when we were both working for a production company in San Diego. Um, apparently when Scotty saw me, is this fair to say? Go for it. It was love at first sight. I had this little stumbling block, as I think I've told you that I was married at the time. Um, but Scotty and I struck up this great friendship, and we'd have great philosophical talks. Um, and I think this is one thing that was important, and I would actually offer his advice about relationships, uh, is that friendship is really a key, core, important ingredient. So we were friends first, and we'd have arguments about karma and philosophical things like that. And I will also admit, <laughs> that um, Scotty's quite a bit younger than, than I. So I thought I was going to, because this guy was so great, fix him up with my stepdaughter. And she was on the, um, the cheer team for, uh, she was going to Oregon State. And her team was coming down, the basketball team, to play at um, UCLA. So I, since her, she was going to come as a cheer girl, I invited Scotty 
Scott to come with me and Bill and come meet Kelly. And the whole drive up from San Diego to LA, all Scott did was talk about these flippin' earrings that he made for this other woman that he was interested in. And they were yin yang. And I remember sitting in the front seat next to my then husband and literally said to myself, I wish somebody loved me like that. And after my marriage ended and I'd had a few months and Scotty had had an experience where um, she was meditating one day and said that she saw me and this had been months and months since we'd worked together um, she called and said I have an experience I want to share with you and came to visit we went for a walk and I just fell in love with this being on the walk and she basically never left after that. So it sounds like your uh, marriage and relationship has both moved through transgender <laughs> and has also transcended, transcended any kinds of labels or um, boxes uh, or uh, naming of, of any kind. And that's really inspiring um, in this time. Um, I want to thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Scotty, for coming to Google and sharing your story and being human with us mm. about, um, about how we can love in any circumstance. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, guys.